have to be smart enough to take the lessons of history so that you can be prepared to, to deal with things in the future. So that, that's my first point. The second point, just to put, put a context around this, 2017 is dramatically different than 1989 and 2001. It just is. And uh, delving into the past is only important to prepare yourself for the future. And I know there's a fascination about this. And I'm, cautious about ex expressing these things because of that very fact. I'm running not about the past, not about val validating or vindicating anything that happened in the past. I'm running to be prepared to fix the things that are challenging our country right now and going forward. So what, what, what have I learned? Well, I learned uh, from my dad that humility is not a sign of weakness, it's a sign of strength. That the idea that somehow the volume of your voice is a measurement of your strength is a dangerous measurement. That, sure, you need to have conviction and you need to have a spine and a backbone, but it's not measured by how you disparage people. In fact, I think you win over people that don't agree with you uh, with conviction, with intelligence, and with kindness. I do not, I just reject out of hand um, this notion that somehow in the culture we're in today that yelling at people and disparaging them is a sign of strength. It isn't. It's a sign of deep inadequacy and weakness. And you know what I'm talking about. So I learned that from my dad. Uh, I learned, as it relates to foreign policy from my, from my dad, that you have to be all in, that America's leadership is essential in the world, and that you do this with personal diplomacy, with a consistency, with a resolve, with a conviction, where the world knows where we stand and you you lead. You, if you don't lead, people don't follow. And the best example, I think, of one of the great success stories, two great success stories during my, my dad's four years was in Operation Desert Storm, <coughs> where a real coalition was created that was from Russia and China to every country in Europe to the entire Middle East, allowing Saudi Arabia allowing the infidels to launch their, uh, their mission out of Saudi Arabia into Kuwait, I don't know if that will ever happen again. It was a pretty extraordinary effort, and it required the personal leadership of my dad to convince, to persuade. And that personal diplomacy, creating a mission, not veering from the mission, and then using the PAL doctrine, which now, after the fact, it was called that, of just, just you know, unmerciful force to achieve the objective and leave and finish the mission and not create another mission. That, I think, is the proper role for, for American leadership. And American leadership was also um, exhibited when my dad uh, was maybe not the only ally of Germany during the, the fall of the Berlin Wall, but certainly the only country of consequence to say, we're with you on the unification. Imagine what the world would look like today if uh, Germany, Germany was not unified for fear of its consolidation of power creating a, um, a problem in Europe. That was literally the path that we were on. So what I learned from my dad was being convicted based on experience and based on you know, knowledge, whatever convicts you on a certain subject, stick with it and recognize that your leadership can make a difference. Because but for George Bush, Helmut Kohl probably would not have been able to um, to unify Germany. Could have happened maybe later, but it would have happened in a more, much more chaotic way. What I learned from my brother is a couple of things. By the way, I learned from my dad that when you make a pledge that is as, you know, I just finished reading Meekham's book. When you make a pledge that you're not going to raise taxes, you better not raise taxes. <laughs> you're only a one-term president, just to put that on the record. I mean, these pledges matter. People, people are actually listening when you're, you know, giving your nominating speech, and um, the motivations for doing what he did actually set the stage for your uh, interesting description of the '90s, by the way, uh, because the budget constraints that happened in that budget agreement and uh, the economic growth that had already started. Four, five, six percent growth for two quarters running when my, in 1992 when my dad was a candidate, but people didn't feel it, was a jump start for the next administration that was pretty powerful, far more powerful than tax increases that he did impose. I think that had a uh, destabilizing impact on growth, not, a, not an increase in it. So 
there was a reason why I did it, but I think it was um, uh, in a world where you have competing challenges, I think maintaining that pledge, if you make it, was important to do. So it relates to my brother, you're going to launch a, an initiative. You better make sure the intelligence capabilities of this country are second to none, and clearly they weren't. Democrats and Republicans alike looked at the same intelligence information, and it was faulty. And I think the lesson learned there is, I don't care if you're a liberal or conservative, you better want the, the finest, most uh, complete intelligence capabilities, both not just technolo not technological, but human intelligence to make when you're making those kind of decisions. And what I admire about my brother, uh, lesson learned domestically, you got to start vetoing things when Republicans start acting like Democrats. There was a spending spree that was inappropriate for conservative. The conservative party should not be advocating. We're like the we're like the Democratic Party, just a little less so. We got to stand for things, and you know you tarnish your brand when you don't stand for limited government. And my brother should have uh, spanked the Congress a few times to bring about a little bit of discipline, and he didn't do it. He had good reasons again. The reasons were he wanted to sustain support for the for the fight uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan, which he considered to be important. And what I admire about my brother was his dogged determination. You know, we have too many politicians that look at polls, they wet their pants, that's a technical term, <laughs> and they bend with the wind. A lot of people. There are a lot of people right now running for president that had dramatically different views on education, immigration, on a bunch of things on ISIS, and, and the, the worm turns, conditions change, and all of a sudden, oh my God, oh my God, people are coming to town hall meetings angry at me, I better shift my position. No, if you believe something, you better stick with it. Because if you think it's tough running for president, or having someone who may, may be misinformed about your view, if you can't persuade them what's in your heart, what's in your mind, uh, how are you going to persuade Putin to change his behavior? Or president Xi, who has a, has a Global ambition that, that you know that is long-standing and so over the long haul that creates real risk for our country. I just think it's important when you believe something to stick with it. And the surge is a phenomenal example of that. Against all the political class in Washington, including Republicans, uh, he brought about fragile stability in Iraq, and it was heroic what the men and women did that brought about the surge that brought stability. It was incredible. It will be looked at in history as one of the great American success stories of our military. And my brother stuck with it, and I admire that a lot, too. So I gave you a, a balanced view. Here's what I, some you know, pros and cons on both. Is that, that's kind of what everybody seems to want, so I'm trying to feed the beast. Here's what, here's what I believe. I'll, I'll tell you what I really think. I love my father, and I love my brother, period, over and out. 